Thank you very much for coming to the talk this evening, I really appreciate it. Uh, I've tried to put a bit of a Merseyside flavour to the talk. Uh, the book, unfortunately, doesn't include very much of Liverpool, sorry about that. Um, but it does include cities on six continents, so I've covered quite a lot of the globe. So I think there'll be something of interest to most of you. But yeah, I've tried to just get some Liverpool into this one, especially for you guys. Um, we're doing, let's get started, page down. No? No? Oh, there you go. Okay, so why cities? I have spent the last couple of years just completely obsessed by cities. And I just want to tell you why. Um, there's lots of reasons, actually. One, you can probably guess from my accent that I am not from around these parts. Um, I've lived in London for over 11 years now, which is kind of terrifying. Um, and I think that, I, you know, I came from a pretty small town in Ireland, didn't have a, a massive appreciation of the built environment or its complexity until I moved to London. Um, and then once I was there, I was kind of caught like a rabbit in headlights mm -hmm. at all of the this infrastructure and all of these networks and this flow of information and people and goods that just seemed to happen without us thinking about it. And a huge part of my inspiration for the book came from that, came from that experience of, of living in London. Um, as city dwellers, and it's true for Liverpool, of course, too, we're in the rather privileged position of being able to access energy, water, we get our waste taken away, we have internet access, the flick of the switch. And that makes us quite unique, actually, it's especially in, in kind of wealthier cities like we are in today. The other thing is, for me, cities kind of, they encapsulate a lot of the big questions. So very deep within the noise of living in a city, there's a huge number of what seem like small questions, but actually have much wider implications. You know, I've often wondered about why why traffic is so bad. Like, why isn't there? Why can't we make traffic flow more easily through our cities? Or where does your waste go when you flush the loo? I will tell you later. Uh, for which I apologise in advance because I'm actually a little bit obsessed with sewers now. So. Sorry, um, but I'm a scientist by training, I'm a material scientist. Um, before I wrote this book, I worked at the National Physical Laboratory down in Teddington, um, and I've got an astrophysics background before that. So like all scientists and all engineers, I'm constantly trying to understand what's going on around me, and I'm constantly asking questions, and cities helped me to get that fixed. Again, for me, we have a lot of huge global challenges that are facing us. Our climate's changing, Population's growing, inequality doesn't seem to be getting any better, unfortunately. And they aren't things that will just affect us in cities, but they are the same things that planners, urban planners, have to ask. So you've got questions that they need to answer. How can we move more people around cities? How can we make sure they're getting the food and nutrition they need? How can we give, give them enough electricity? How can we get their communications going? These are all questions that are scaled up to the globe. They're all questions we're all facing. And I say we are urbanites because in 2014, the UN released this huge report which said that 54% of the world's population now live in cities. So for the first time in human history, more of us live in cities than don't. And no matter what numbers you look at, that proportion doesn't look like it's going to shrink anytime soon. And that then leads us on to bigger, busier cities. And with bigger and busier cities, we have bigger and more complex questions to answer. And I think there's lots and lots of answers that science and technology can help, uh, help us to kind of build and change the way we build cities to produce more sustainable futures for all of us. So I'm going to take you through kind of five ingredients, I guess, of a city um, and talk about some interesting things that I found out about in the book. And I'll also try and talk about either some future technology or really cool things that other cities are doing that maybe we could learn our lessons from. So I would hope that most of you maybe recognise this building. It's the Shard in London. Um, everyone has their own opinion on it. <laughs> um, but it is still the UK's tallest building. Does anyone have any idea how tall it is? Can we guess? 
not quite. Uh, well, actually, feet. That's a good question. I have no idea. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. SI units. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so it's 309 meters tall, right? Which basically, it's 10 times the Radio City Tower. So if you stack 10 Radio City Towers on top of one another, you're getting to the height of the tallest building in the world, which is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. If any of you have seen that, it is just unbelievably tall. It's, you cannot comprehend. When you have a building that is penetrating through the clouds as you fly into Dubai, you know it's tall. So the Shard is small compared to the Burj Khalifa. And unfortunately, much as I love the Radio City Tower, it's small compared to the Shard. But tall structures tend to have a lot of things in common. So let's talk about some of the things you have to consider when you're thinking about building a tall structure. The first thing is what's going on beneath the ground. And geology is a huge part of every, every engineer's kind of thought process when they're looking at it, designing a tall building. Around here, you've got mostly sandstone and mudstone. And I know you can't read the incredibly tiny text on that image on the left. Um, but the kind of peachy pink area is sandstones. And they're very useful to build on, but they don't, they don't have great compressive strength. So if you're building a really tall structure on top of this, often, if you don't design it well, it will compress the sand and mudstones. So what you tend to have to use are something called piles. So that's the image on the right-hand side. And these are huge, huge piles. They're normally made from steel. Sometimes they're, instead of piles like this, you might use reinforced concrete. But the idea being that they burrow down until you get to a nice stiff layer of whatever rock is available to you. So you're trying to give a foundation that you can then build your skyscraper on. Because the thing about skyscrapers is, is that the dead load, which is, what, which is what you call all the materials that make up the actual skyscraper, so like the concrete, the steel, all of those things, the dead load and the live load, all the other stuff, like humans, that we put inside our buildings, they all need to be supported by these foundations. So they're incredibly important. And you have to think about this long before you think about what the building's going to look like. You're always looking down below before you start reaching up. The Shard is in a kind of just south of the river in London. And that has, that's a kind of an area that's quite clay-based. So again, not, not good at compressive strength. You can't just build a tall building on top of it. They actually dug down. Their piles are 53 meters down. So they're incredibly, incredibly deep piles just to support the building above it. And most tall structures, and this isn't true for all, but most tall structures tend to be wider at the base than they are at the top. And that's to give it a nice wide foundation as well as a really deep one, to give it that support that it needs to reach up. There's no simple equation to say how big, how wide or deep your foundation should be for a particular structure. It's all about working with geologists and working with surveyors to decide, to decide how tall you can go and how deep you have to go. So there's a real kind of contrast. You kind of, I think a lot of people think about civil engineering as just this concrete structure. But actually, there's a huge overlap with geology, and it's really, really needed as well. But when we go above the ground, when we start building tall structures, the biggest enemy that faces us is wind. And wind is actually the dominating factor in every skyscraper. Even in areas of seismic activity, wind is a bigger problem. And if you think about it, these skyscrapers, and the one on the right-hand side is a model of the Burj Khalifa, which is the tallest building in the world, they're just enormous sails that are sitting there open to the environment. And just like a sail, it will buffet in the wind. So you have to think about the, the size and shape, and sometimes the orientation of your building to make sure that the wind doesn't have disastrous consequences. So the little gift that you can see there, does anyone know what that process is called, that idea? Vortex shedding. Vortex shedding, yeah, exactly. So the, the blobs that you see, the kind of purple and green blobs, um, are vortices. So these are basically packets of wind that build up around mostly a symmetrical structure. So there it's like a cylinder. And it's no problem to have buffeting. A building can cope with a bit of turbulence. That's no problem. The thing about these vortices is that they produce a beat, they produce a rhythm. And very often that wind, even if it's not very, it's not very fast wind, it's not very strong wind, it can actually 
caused the building to sway because the building has what's called a resonant frequency, which most of you know about, a natural frequency at which it wants to move. And very often, these vortices match that resonant frequency. So the building will sway a small bit, and then these vortices start building up, and the building will sway more and more and more. If you think about it like on a swing, if you're on a swing, and I know even though you're all adults, you love going on swings. We all do it. But you think about, like, instinctively you understand when to kick your feet, right? You know that if you kick your feet at the right time, you amplify your swing. If you kick your feet at the wrong time, you mess your swing up. And that's kind of, you're kind of matching the resonant frequency of the swing each time you're doing that. So just by matching it, you make the swing bigger and bigger and bigger. And this is a real issue when you're talking about skyscraper design. This isn't something that you can just ignore. I'm just gonna give you a slightly uh, terrifying uh, thing. The Burj Khalifa, which is the stiffest building in the world. So we have never built a structure that is more able to cope with the wind and resist the wind. The very top of the building on a very windy day sways by about two to four meters. You can feel that. <laughs> if you're on the top of that building, you can feel that. And that is the stiffest one we've ever built. That's the best at resisting that wind force. Because when in the lower, in the lower atmosphere that we're all in, as you build up, generally wind speed gets higher, and that's fine. But as well as that, the pressure exerted by the wind on a structure increases by the wind speed squared. So the taller your building is, the more wind stress it has to cope with. The Burj Khalif has done a bit of a clever thing to make it as stiff as it is. It has what's called a buttressed core, right? So it's basically a central spine, like the spine of the human body, that runs the whole distance from the very bottom of the foundations to the very top of the Burj. And that acts just like our spine does. It gives it a rigid structure around which to build the building. They also did quite a clever thing that they started to look at how they could, what's called, confuse the wind. So not just stop these vortices from building up, but actually stop any sort of turbulence building up. And this is why, that's a wind tunnel that's in, it's a pretty big, pretty big wind tunnel. But that, they did a huge amount of wind tunnel testing. And the Burj is in the middle of the desert, so it's buffeted constantly. And they realized that they actually could orientate the building. They turned, they turned it by about four degrees, and it got rid of all of the turbulence. So some very clever wind engineering happening in, in skyscrapers. And does anyone recognize what the big thing on the bottom left is? Pendulum. It's pendulum, yeah, exactly. It's a tuned mass damper, is what it's called. So the idea of this is, if you've got a building, say, in an area of high seismic activity, and it starts to sway, in the case of an earthquake, this is a big, heavy ball that basically sways in the opposite direction, slows down the bullet. So the tallest buildings around us, they use kind of all of these tools together to try and make them as stiff and as strong as possible. So now I want to give it a tiny bit of future gazing. This uh, crystal structure here on the left-hand side is a material called perovskite, and it's the next big thing in solar energy. So most of you will have seen solar panels before. They're kind of a bluey-gray color. That's because they're made of silicon. We use silicon because silicon is pretty cheap to produce. We understand how it works. It's not actually even nearly the best material at turning sunlight into electricity. It has a very, it has a, an, a, an upper limit to its efficiency, but it's still quite a low efficiency. We just use it because we understand it. So people are going back to the drawing boards, looking at new materials that can actually capture sunlight more efficiently. And perovskite is really the, the thing that everyone's talking about at the moment. Um, the benefit of them is that you can tune perovskite materials. And they're generally calcium titanates. So it's more about the shape of the structure rather than the materials. But you can tune them so that it will capture particular wavelengths of light. So if you think about a solar panel, that only harvests a very small bit of the spectrum, the solar spectrum. So lots of, re of the rest of it's just thrown away. Whereas there are people working on layering these device, layering these materials on top of one another. So you can capture more of the wavelengths of sunlight, so that makes them more efficient. But the really cool thing is they do it with a very thin layer. So you can actually produce solar panels that look effectively transparent to our eyes, which seems very odd and not very instinctive, but it's because they capture wavelengths outside of our visible range, right? 
And there's some guys in Oxford who are developing these, and they've done some really interesting modeling, uh, which I really like. The building that you can see here is it's called the cheese grater. It's not actually its name, uh, but who cares, because it's really great. Um, they did some measurements about actual solar levels, and like sunlight levels in London. They looked at all the shadows that are formed by other buildings around this, but they still think that if they could clad this building in perovskite glass, so it wouldn't look any different from the outside, they could produce, let me get this number right, because I always get it wrong, it's about a gigawatt of electricity. That's about half of the electricity the building needs to run. So it's ambitious, and we're still a long way from doing it. But this, the efficiencies of these materials, they've only, they were only discovered like six years ago, and they've gone up from 5% to 20%. It's a huge, huge change, and they're only going one way, and I'm really excited about this. As a material scientist, I love this stuff. So one of the things I want to do as well is answer some generic questions about cities. Um, and this actually is not relevant to Liverpool because none of your tall buildings have rotating doors. It's very annoying. I went around Google Street, Street View, looking at all your tallest buildings, none of them have rotating doors. But I'm going to tell you about it anyway because it's interesting. Um, I'm a big fan of rotating doors because they're fun, but they also have a genuine engineering reason that we use them. <laughs> And it's because they're always closed. Tall buildings can act like chimneys. If you think about this, basically what they are, especially tall buildings that have an open foyer. So in the winter, we like to have our buildings to be nice and hot. So we've got lots of hot air inside the building. If we have a swinging door, we open that door, all the hot air rushes out and cold air rushes in. And you get that very unique kind of skirt lifting wind in the foyer. And this, the opposite is true in the summer. The air inside tends to be cooler than the air outside. If you had a swinging door, you just get this big turbulent exchange of air. But a spinning door is always closed. So even though people are moving in and out of the building all the time, it's sealed from the inside, right? It's sealed by the fact that the door is always closed. And although that's kind of nice because you don't want it to be windy in the foyer, longer term, Changes in temperature through the stacks, this is called the stack effect. Changes in temperature can actually change the structure of the building, they can damage the structure of the building. And they also have a big impact on energy bills as well. So rotating doors are there for genuine scientific and engineering reason. So now we get into the slightly grosser stuff. Um, water and waste, right? This is, we are at this point in humanity that we have never and I, I mean this very seriously, we are fighting a battle with water. Most of our cities are water stressed, so we're not producing enough for our needs. We are terrible in the way that we use our water. We're incredibly wasteful. Um, as most of you probably realize, we wash our dishes and we clean ourselves with drinking quality water, which is mental <laughs> because drinking quality water takes a lot of money and a lot of time to produce to get it that clean. And actually, we're using the cleanest water to do some dirty jobs. So we've got a real issue. There's actually more than 700 million people on Earth who do not have access to clean water. That's considerably more than the number of people who live in the USA. So it's a big, big challenge. And sometimes cities might not seem like the most obvious place to have answers, but there might be some answers there. So this is a really lovely picture of, of Liverpool, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, the first dock in the city opened in the 1700s, and basically from then on, industry just grew, just kept growing. Huge factories, huge industrial processes, all based around the Mersey. And back in the day, there wasn't quite the uh, kind of level of, of, of worry about cleanliness of the river water, so most of the industrial waste was dumped straight into the river. Most of the human waste was also dumped straight into the river. So you can imagine that on a summer day, it wasn't that pleasant. This was actually a huge problem in the 1800s in London, and it became known as the Great Stink. The smell on the river became so bad, the city literally ran to a halt for days. So this is a really serious problem, and every city in the UK was having the same problem at the same time. So sewers were needed, and actually James Newlands was one of the first people in the world, from Liverpool, was one of the first people in the world to build a sewer system that actually worked. He built, I think it was 300 miles of sewers in about 20 years. And before he started building those sewers here, the 
a kind of predicted age, your life, your lifespan in Liverpool, you would live to 19 on average. Honestly, and this is like, this is the 1800s. It's not, I know it's a long time ago, but it's not that long ago. And after he'd built the sewers, that life expectancy is more than doubles. So it made a huge difference. And in London as well, it was Basil Jess who built the sewers there. Um, there was a, there's a more kind of visible side to the sewers though, and they're the two things you see on the right hand side. They're called stink pipes, and I'm almost sure that you'll have walked past one and never ever noticed it. This is the kind of surface level version of the sewer. Its job was to take all of the gas, really nasty, flammable, toxic gas that's being produced in the sewers, and lift them above the street level so delicate Victorian noses didn't have to worry about it. In industrial cities like Liverpool, it was much more serious because air quality was a huge problem. So these sink pipes were built along the same route as the sewers. And from ground level, they normally look like the kind of rusted one in the middle. So they just look like a street lamp. You, do, you, don't, you walk past it and you wouldn't think anything of it. But if you knock on it, it's hollow. And it is still, they're still, that's still their job. They're still there to move all of those delicious gases. Um, from out of sewers. So the next time you walk past one that looks like it might be one, just give it a knock. And if it's hollow, it's almost certainly a stink pipe. And be, be very grateful for it because otherwise that smell would be at ground level. So they, it has been a very useful thing. And the gases are methane, hydrogen sulfide, not pleasant. And they're still doing their job today. So Victorian infrastructure doing its job. Now, I just want to give you something, and this is an estimate, so I apologize because no one in Liverpool would tell me the actual number. Um, but scaling down from the amount of poo that's produced in London, um, it's about 288 million kilograms of poo produced in Liverpool. Yeah. Which is really, I, just, I mean, it's comforting, I guess. Um, but what's most comforting is that it's not being pumped around the streets, right? It's actually going through these sewers. And there was quite Sorry? Oh, in a year. Sorry, in a year. Yeah, so like every year. So in London, it's, it's about 1.25 billion kilograms of poo a year. Um, and also, just another comforting thought, uh, it actually flows. So while you're walking down the street, there's a little sewer just poo flowing down. <laughs> uh, it only gets pumped when it gets to the sewage plant. So it goes down to the sewage plant and then gets pumped up to be treated. So, sorry about that, you guys. Um, but let's talk about water just for a minute. So the, the tap water that you drink is almost certainly as clean if not cleaner than the stuff we buy in bottles. In fact, many water suppliers use municipal supplies. They literally take the same water you get from your tap, they put it in a bottle. Um, and the way that, they, the way that our, our, our water treatment works in the UK, it generally takes maybe not all seven of these, sometimes it takes eight steps, it depends on the city, but they all take the same, roughly the same kind of structure. So the first one is coagulation. So it's where you gather all the big stuff and you add some, add some chemicals to it that starts to clump all the bigger stuff together. And that, those big clumps are called flocks. And then you've got flocculation, which is a new favorite word of mine. I, it's very hard to work into a conversation, but I do try. Um, but yeah, you kind of mix the water up and get more of those clumps to join together. When they get big enough, they drop to the bottom. That's sedimentation. And then we filter that out. Then after that, you've got the kind of more chemical treatment. So some cities will add fluoride to the water, some don't. All cities will disinfect their water, and some might push them through incredibly small filters to try and get rid of some microbes as well. And then it's stored. And actually, let me just go back for one second. These are like storage tanks. So if you've ever, if you've flown out of a, an airport, you may have seen these before. And that's storing the water that will eventually get to your taps. Um, the other side of water, and this is not a fountain, this is a leak, a uh, pretty spectacular leak, which is in Halewood, so not very far from here, uh, not very long ago. Leaky pipes are a huge problem, especially because if you go back to that Victorian infrastructure issue again. But we've got to give them some slack, all right? Those pipes have been around for like 200 years, so they've done pretty well. There is a real challenge, though, with replacing those pipes. It's not very easy to just build a new infrastructure and then just reroute all your water that way. So what a lot of cities do is they do a kind of a piecemeal job. So they might replace some of the pipes with newer materials. Lead pipes were very popular uh, in Victorian times and now we would like to not use lead in our pipes because it's 
can be really poisonous. Um, so a lot of cities are replacing sections of lead pipes with sections of copper pipe, because we like copper. What we realize, though, is that can actually cause more lead to be put into the water, because you have something called galvanic corrosion. And that's the type of corrosion you get when you have two metals together. Because fundamentally, two metals together with an electrolyte, so like a, a liquid that likes to conduct electricity, it's basically a, a battery. But like a really disappointing battery, but a battery nonetheless. And so what ends up happening is just like in a battery, you have ions that move between the two electrodes. But if it's a water pipe, and it's a copper pipe, and a lead pipe, there's only one loser, and that's lead. So actually, sometimes, having fewer lead pipes can release more lead into your water supply. So it's a challenge, but it just shows that you should never do a half-assed job. Just replace it all in one go, or don't bother. So now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some cool things. These are not future technologies, but these are technologies that other cities are using that we're not. These are two vehicles that have something very useful in common, and there's a clue on the bus. They get their fuel from the local sewage plants. The bus on the left is, has been nicknamed the number two bus. Uh, you can probably guess why. Um, when you, so the official word for, for sewage is black water. So that's black water is the water that, had, that has had feces in it. Okay? No one wants to drink that. It's incredibly dangerous, it's full of pathogens. So, but there's other things that we can do with it, right? So it's quite useful. And I was just at a sewage plant last week. And it was much smellier than I thought. I'm going to be honest, I thought it was going to be fine, but no, it was really sticky. Um, but if you have that black water, you can use microbes to break down the feces. And microbes, you might not know this, but they fart a lot, like cows. Cows get like a really bad name for this, but everything that digests organic material produces methane as a byproduct, which is sticky. But methane can be used as a, as a vehicle fuel, and that's what this poo bus is run on. In Stockholm, which is a city I spent a lot of time in, um, they, you, most of this, this taxi company is all over the city, and they're almost all run on bio, bio, biogas, as they like to call it, even. also produced from human waste. So this is a waste product that's a real problem for us, that we, can't, we don't want to just get rid of. There's nowhere for us to put it. So other cities are starting to see that there's a real use for it. We can actually use it and make use of it especially in a fuel form, which isn't something that we have a lot of, right? We're trying to get away from fossil fuels. In Stockholm, last year, they produced about 76,000 tonnes of sludge and then converted almost all of that into vehicle fuel. So it's quite interesting. Um, this fuel is quite useful too. Uh, the fastest, uh, actually, I'll tell you this, because 2015, there's a land speed record for buses. Now, I, you may know this, but I was unaware that there was even, that was even a thing. But the land speed record for buses is now held by a poo-powered bus. So it is quite a useful thing. That bus though was actually powered by cow dung rather than human waste. So. Okay, so where does Liverpool's waste go? It's amazingly difficult to find the answer to some of these questions. People really think you're weird when you phone them up and be like, where did my waste go? Uh, but I'm quite used to that. There's a mixture of things. Merseyside as a whole recycled about 41% of its waste last year, which is pretty good. They're aiming for 55%, so there's still a way to go. But actually, in terms of cities in the UK, you guys are doing really, really well. Um, some of the waste then goes to materials recovery facilities. Some of it goes to incinerators. Ooh, boo. Uh, that produces a lot of pollutants. No one, wants, no one wants incinerators to just keep being used. But we are starting to find better ways to extract energy from that waste that we are currently burning. And some of your waste is really heavily processed and is then used in fertilizer and agriculture. So it's not quite, it's not toilet farm because the waste has been processed so, so much. Um, but it is being used in agriculture. The other thing I want to mention is something called a fatberg. Uh, I don't know if you guys know about this, it's kind of sinister, but there's a huge ball of fat in your sewers right now. Um, and they are enormous. The biggest, the longest one is the length of a 767, <laughs> and it was found in a sewer in London. The heaviest um, was the weight of, well, just slightly heavier than a double-decker bus. 
And these are enormous globules of fat and baby wipes. <laughs> so if, you've, um, if, if you have been throwing baby wipes down the toilet, please don't, please, please don't. When, the, when they say disposable, what that means is that it fits down the U bend of your toilet. It does not mean it is biodegradable. So actually, your smartphone is also, uh, is, that could technically be called flushable, right? It could be called flushable, but it doesn't actually mean it biodegrades. And it floats on top of the water. And fat also floats on top of the water because it doesn't mix. So then they start to attract each other and they grow and grow and grow. And I cannot explain the smell. <laughs> It is something you do not forget. Uh, they, these get so big and so dense, you have to break them up with a jackhammer. And having done that, I'm not in a rush to do it again. So please, please stop throwing baby wipes down the toilet. Just put them in the bin. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about trains. This is me um, in my high vis uh, in the crossrail tunnels. So I don't know if you guys have heard about crossrail. Brand new set of tunnels being built through London, crossing London like an X, hence the crossrail. Um, which they've now dubbed the Elizabeth Line, which is really stupid, but anyway. Um, sorry, it's being recorded. I should stop saying stuff like that. Anyway, um, but tunnels are a really big thing in cities now. We've actually built more record-breaking tunnels since the year 2000 than in the previous 150 years. So this is as I see it, but I'm biased because I love tunnels. This is the golden age, right? We have gotten into a stage at which cities are bigger and busier, the surface, you've got limited space, limited footprints, we're having to go under the ground. And Liverpool's been one of those cities that's been leading on this for a really long time. You love your tunnels, guys. I really do. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I, that cities for me are, that's one of the most interesting things about cities. Um, so the picture on the left is the Mersey Rail Tunnel, which I'm sure that you have all gone through on occasion. It is the world's oldest underground railway after the tube in London. So you should be very proud of that. Uh, and it's still in use. Again, Victorian infrastructure, still in use every single day. Um, it was, there's a bit of a controversy about when it opened and all this kind of stuff, but it was basically the late 1800s, like 1886 was basically when it opened to the public. And we're still using it now. These tunnels were dug, they were excavated using a combination of drilling and explosives. So quite old school, um, but it worked. Again, the geology, remember, is mostly sandstone and clay. That's really good for tunnels. You get, a nice, you get a nice dispersal of the forces from those kind of materials. It's harder to dig through other materials, but it's really, really good for tunnels. The Thames Tunnel in London, which is probably the most famous like under, underwater tunnel, let's say, uh, that attracted 50,000 visitors on its first day. Um, so it was a huge thing. It, was, it wasn't just a new piece of infrastructure, it was a tourist attraction. And that was true for Liverpool's tunnels as well. Putting a tunnel under a river is a huge engineering challenge even now. But we were doing this in the 1800s. The thing on the right is also a train tunnel, but this is um, a digital reconstruction of, an, of a train tunnel. I was really shocked to hear, and you may not be shocked to hear, but Currently, if we're maintaining our tunnels, it is done using a stick. Not like a high-tech stick with a camera on it, like an actual stick with a rubber bung on the top. So people like rail engineers are having to walk through these tunnels, visually inspect it and say, yeah, I think that crack is bigger than it was when I saw it last year. And they're using the stick to just check that bricks aren't falling out. That is not efficient. That's not an efficient use of these experts' time. It really isn't. There's only so much that they can do. So, uh, um, as I mentioned, I used to work at MPL, National Physical Lab, and the lab next door to me, um, these guys designed this system called DIFCAM. And uh, there's so many acronyms, but I won't go into it. But it's basically a Land Rover that has 12 digital cameras in an arc around it, and one looking down at the track. It also has a laser scanner on the roof which is very similar to the laser scanner that Google's driverless car is using. And basically, you can drive this Land Rover uh, through a tunnel, and it takes images every millimetre, every, as often as you want, to be honest. And it also laser scans. So you've got the scanner that's constantly spinning. And together, the images from the laser scanner and from the optical image from the, from the digital SLR cameras can build up a digital reconstruction of this tunnel. And the benefit of that is that you can go back again next year and start, you know, you think, oh, there was a crack that looked a bit dodgy there last year. I'm just going to drive it to there. I'll take another image. And then the rail engineers use their expertise properly. They can use them to be like, 
that does look dangerous, that does look like something we need to fix. Because Victorian infrastructure can't just be ripped out and replaced. We have to be maintaining it. And although it's not very sexy, it's really important that we do this, especially in the UK, where most of our infrastructure is based on this time. Um, explosives were great for tunnels for a while, but we've moved along from them. On the left-hand side, you can see something called a tunnel boring machine, which is effectively an enormous mechanical earthworm, for want of a better word. Um, at the front, you've got, you can see the kind of the, the wheel on the front. It's covered in, in teeth from a material called tungsten carbide, which is a very, very tough material. And this, this face rotates and munches its way through the clay or through the rock. And it sucks all of that digested rock goo uh, into its body and mixes it with other chemicals. And you produce something that has a consistency of like toothpaste. Um, and it gets pumped out of the tunnel at the, back, at the end. It can then get cleaned up and used for other construction projects. And I spent a lot of time in crossrail tunnels. Um, yeah, kind of a little bit obsessed. And, and the crossrail tunnels were dug using eight of these, these uh, big, big earthworms, these tunnel boring machines. And the Thames Tunnel, the new Thames Tunnel, took one of these machines about eight months to dig, which is still quite a long time. But the Brunel Thames Tunnel took about 16 years. So we're much faster at building our tunnels too. Um, and a tunnel is great, it's, it's one, it's all, it's all well and good, but then you also need to clad it. So you can see on the image on the right with my really embarrassing face, um, these, these gray pieces of concrete. These are rings that the tunnel boring machine, after it's munching its way through, further back has a big hydraulic arm and lifts these pieces into place and then one final wedge-shaped piece to hold it as a ring. So you then have like a permanent tunnel. Um, but that's not quite enough for a train system, right? So we actually need tracks as well. So I'm gonna take a break from talking for a minute and let video Laurie um, talk at you about one of the technologies Crossrail's using. I standard 30 meters on the and as a whole, numerous recording experience, vibration and noise can play to cause big problems here. So this is my graph Um, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, I sound so much more Irish like when I listen back to myself than I do in my head. Um, anyway, so now I'm going to tell you a little bit about a, kind of a future project, a future tunnel. And again, some of you might recognise this if you're a tunnel nerd like myself. Um, as I said, like we now we're in this era of tunneling where we're going further, we're making bigger tunnels, we're doing it more quickly than we've ever done before. There is one project though that wants to push it a whole lot further, and I am really skeptical about it. Uh, but then I'm a physicist, so that's part of my DNA. Um, this is Hyperloop, which I'm sure you guys have heard about because it's another one of Elon Musk's amazing projects uh, that he's funding. And the idea of it is that you would build tunnels that you run vacuum trains through, right? So I'll talk about the vacuum train in a minute. But this map is the first proposed route. And it's looking at, it's going basically from Stockholm to Helsinki. And it's normally a very, very long journey that requires many ferry journeys along the way. So it takes, day, it almost takes like days to go along. Our longest tunnel that we've ever made is 57 kilometers long, which just opened this year, which is an incredible piece of engineering. This one basically would completely dwarf that. The distance is about uh, 500 kilometers and they want to tunnel most of the way through and they want to do it in about 10 years. So I, for me, I'm not sure the numbers match up. I'm really, you know, I want to be really behind it. I think it's really interesting and I'm fascinated by the ambition of it, but I think that we're a little bit further away than perhaps we would, uh, than they would like to be. Um, so the idea of the vacuum train is that you do away with the big thing that stops trains from being fast right now, which is air. 
So as a train is punching through the air, that's what's slowing it down. That's what limits its speed. So like the bullet trains in Japan have a kind of a pointy nose. They're much more aerodynamic than our trains, so they can go faster. But eventually there's a limit because the air is still there. By pumping out all of the air from these tunnels, you can reach much higher speeds in theory. And this is not a new idea. It's been around, it's been like a futurist dream for a really long time. Uh, but if, if they managed to do it, if they managed to do it, you could have these trains that could get close to the speed of sound. So that would be like London to Edinburgh in about 15 minutes. So you can see like what the attraction of it, and I really hope it works, I really do. And I've actually written a blog post for these guys because I'm fascinated by their approach to tunneling. But uh, yeah, I'm skeptical. So tunnels are windy and we know that. So I've said the, Cre the Queensway tunnel here, I know it's not a train tunnel, um, but that's important too. Uh, the reason train tunnels are windy is because of something called a piston effect, because your train is a very similar size and shape generally to the tunnel that it's in. And as it's moving through the tunnel, the air can't get out of the way quickly enough. So what you get is a kind of a bank of very hot, high pressure air at the front of the train. And then you get a corresponding area, like low pressure air at the back of the train. And just like in weather systems, low pressure, hot air, or high pressure, hot air, low pressure, cold air meet, you get wind. And it's just like, it's called a piston effect because it's kind of like how a piston moves in an engine. But in a road tunnel, it's a slightly different thing because you have smaller vehicles, an enormous tunnel and smaller vehicles. So you do still have some of the piston effect in some ways, but you actually need proper ventilation. And Liverpool, again, is absolutely leading on tunnel ventilation, and they have been for a really long time. There are enormous ventilation buildings on either side of the Mersey, which I'm sure that you've seen. Uh, some are clad in brick. One is clad in Portland stone, and it's a bit of an icon. Um, but inside those buildings that you've never been in and you have the opportunity to go, because I know they open them on tours sometimes, it's so worth going, they're absolutely fascinating. You've got like fans that are in there, the, the highest one is 23 feet in diameter. These are enormous fans that push and pull air through the tunnels so that you're not getting all the smog, all the stuff you're pumping out of the back of your car. Having that in an enclosed space, not a good idea, not a good idea. You want to ventilate that out of there. So the buildings that you see, that's their job. Their job is to push and pull air through, through the tunnel and to take all of the pollutants out, but then it just pumps it straight up into the city air. So it's not ideal, um, but they can deliver a huge amount of air this way. So when you see them, they're not just this structure that looks, I think, very beautiful. They have a real function and the size and shape that they are is, is totally reliant on the amount of air they need to move through those tunnels. So hopefully it's, it's, um, it's Merseyside, okay, it's not quite Liverpool, I get that. Um, but this is the, this is the Jubilee Bridge, so the Silver <laughs> Jubilee Bridge. Um, one of the things I talk about in a chapter in the book are bridges and roads and how we connect our cities together. So we're going to come back to that bridge in particular in a second. Um, but I want to talk a, a tiny bit about um, some historic bridges in the area. So do any of you recognise the, the one on the left? Yeah, exactly, the railway bridge, one point railway bridge. Um, it's been there since, again, guess what, Victorian times, 1869. Um, it's, it's a functional bridge. I think it's beautiful. A lot of people don't like it, but... Um, so you've got, they're basically these big, big stone um, abutments, is what they're called, and they're separated by wrought iron spans. And they were put in place by hand. Normally, when they started to build bridges like this, you'd float them down the river and stick them up on the bridge, but actually in Liverpool, they were built by hand. And it was also a footbridge, so you could now have a train that would move across the river, you would be able to walk across the river, and you could get a ferry across the river. They then put in a canal alongside the river, and then it started, river tra traffic became a bit of an issue. Like, how do you move bigger things across the river? You now have a canal, a wall, and a river. So they built this. I love Pathé videos. They just make me really happy. They're quite, it's quite hard to read, I'm sorry about that, but it was the highest quality one I could, I could stick in here. But this is actually what was called the Witness Runcorn Transporter Bridge. So I don't know, some of you may never have heard of it, um, but it was basically, it had two towers, one on either side of both the river and the canal, so it spanned both, and it had a girder that went between them, and it's basically a cable car. So you can see there's like people and cars being shifted across the river on this transporter bridge. Um, it could carry about 12, 13 vehicles, 
and a few hundred foot passengers. So this is a big cable car. This is not like a little tiny one. This is a big monster of a cable car. And that was there for a very, very long time. And people in Liverpool, it was interesting reading some of the news stories about people being up in arms about getting rid of the transporter bridge and replacing it with something else, which was the Silver Jubilee Bridge. Oh, actually, there is a really good video, I should say, a much longer video about that bridge on the University of Liverpool architecture page. So do have a look. Um, but you can see the picture on the left is the proposed and currently in construction gateway bridge, the Mersey, Merseyside Gateway Bridge. The, the machine that's building it is uh, called Webster, so that's what it's been nicknamed. And it was named that by a local school. I, I love that because it was the name of the engineer who built the transporter bridge, which is a like, very nice continuation of engineering. Apparently it's due to be finished in like this time next year, but having passed it today on the river, I'm not entirely convinced they're going to get that. It doesn't look very close to completion. But um, do you know what kind of a bridge this is? Do you know what it's called? You can, you can be loud, it's fine. Cable today, yeah, yeah. So it's a, spe it's a suspension bridge, basically. So it's a bridge that uses cables and towers to support itself. So these bridges support themselves and everything on them. I'm a huge fan of cable state bridges. My favourite one is the Malay Viaduct in France. I'm in love with it. Um, and that's weird, I know, but it's fine. Um, but these, these bridges are really clever because what the cables do is that they, they basically hold on to the bridge deck, which is the roadway, right? So the bridge deck is held on to by these very, very tough cables, which we'll talk about in a second. It's a rope bridge. Like in a very traditional sense, it's a rope bridge. But the difference are the towers because that tensile stress, so all that strength, that the cables are under, all that tension that the cables are under, is then turned into compressive strength by these towers. So all of the force is being pushed down those towers that are being buried into very, very deep foundations in the river. And like in, in other in normal suspension bridges, the ones with the U-shaped cables, it's exactly the same process. The benefit of a cable state bridge is that they use fewer cables, so they tend to be lighter weight, that makes them cheaper to make. And they're also very like elegant looking because they use, they seem to be floating but they're fully supporting themselves. But the cables themselves are absolutely fascinating, and it's one of the things I looked into a bit in the book as well. Um, the Brooklyn Bridge is probably, probably the most famous cable-based bridge, and each one of those cables, the main cables in the Brooklyn Bridge, is actually 9,000 strands of steel wrapped together. So instead of having like a solid steel cable, you just use these very, very thin steel cables and twist them together. And the reason for that is the structure of steel. So steel, as I hope and what most of you will know, is a mixture of iron and carbon and some other compounds. Um, if you were to have a big lump of steel and you put it under tension, so basically hang a weight off it, it would break because it's made up of these tiny crystals. If you do it very carefully, and you are very careful with your crystal structure and you do it slowly, you actually get those crystals to line up and you make those bonds between them stronger. It's kind of a little bit like cotton. If you think about raw cotton, it's very fluffy and it pulls apart really easily. Whereas if you twist it into a fibre, it holds you close together. It's kind of the same principle. Um, I, but these these uh, bridges can hold, or these cables can hold a lot more than than fabric together. The ones on the Malay Viaduct Bridge, which I think will be fairly similar to the ones that will be on the Mersey Bridge, they're so strong they can hold back 25 jungle jets at full throttle without breaking. So don't ever be worried about a cable snapping. It's not going to happen anytime soon. OK, so this is, um, again, it's not a future technology, but it should be one that we are using in the future. Um, that's waste plastic. You don't need me to tell you that. We produce a lot of waste plastic. Um, but in, in India, they're using this waste plastic as a, as a way to replace bitumen in road surfaces. So they're actually taking away some of the bitumen, which is very energy intensive, very environmentally unfriendly and they're replacing it with a waste material. And the researchers behind this have basically got about, it's nearly 20,000 kilometers of roadway built like this. We have zero kilometers of roadway built like this in the UK. And the process of actually laying the road is basically identical. So it doesn't change the process, it makes it cheaper, it makes it less environmentally damaging. So we should be doing it. So one of my last questions is, why is the Silver Jubilee Bridge an arch? So why do they go for an arch shape? The original idea was actually that they just have a very boring straight bridge, like the, like the railway bridge, a truss bridge. Um, but it was too expensive to produce in newer materials. 
They then looked at a suspension bridge, but again, that was too expensive. But there was also a weird thing where little eddies of wind, so little vortices of wind that were being produced because the railway bridge is that close to it, um, they couldn't do a suspension bridge. So they kind of looked at the Sydney, Sydney Harbour Bridge and took that as the inspiration. And that's a good combination of a stiff deck that like, will hold everything together, will support the wind, stop that wind bucketing around, and the arc that forces all of that, that weight down into the, into the foundations of the bridge. So this is the last bit, traffic. Look, we've all been in it, we all get really sick of it. Um, I'm gonna show you this video. If you've ever been stuck in a phantom traffic jam, so these are tra a traffic jam that just seems to appear even if there's no bottleneck. You can see one happening on this circular track. So there's no, there's no new cars entering this. These drivers were all instructed to get up to a constant speed and stay there and try and keep a safe distance from the driver in front. And you can see already the car's almost at standstill. Um, and it's basically because we are terrible at understanding and judging speed. So if there's a driver in front of you and you see them tap the brakes and the brake lights go on, you brake, probably a little bit too much. The person behind you brakes, behind them brakes. And it, what actually ends up happening is that you don't drive into traffic jams. Traffic jams drive into you. And it is all because of that weird, we have this really bad at, at traveling at a constant speed. Not a situation that ants have to deal with. They're really good at it. And we think it's because they give drivers a bit more headroom. So maybe there's a lesson in there for us. Um, one of the interesting technologies, again, that Liverpool is doing a lot on, like London too, um, is changing the way that pedestrians and cyclists interact with the road. So what you can see here is a thermal image of cyclists on a roadway. And this is something that has been trialled, I think it's on Leeds Street, so you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a heat sensing camera that detects cyclists. The idea being then, if it detects a large number of cyclists, um, it will give the cyclist a five second head start. So it changes the switching pattern of the traffic lights to give the cyclists longer to get through a junction. And in London, they're doing the same for pedestrians. So they're looking at, they can't, they, it's, it's totally anonymized, you can't recognize anyone, but it counts the number of pedestrians that are crossing. And if there's a larger number, it gives you longer to cross the road. So Liverpool, again, is absolutely leading the way on this. <coughs> um, one of my favorite technologies in the future, and not really, I mean, medium term, is hydrogen fuel. So hydrogen fuel cell <coughs> cars. And on the left-hand side, this is a, a hydrogen refueling station, which is actually based at my old lab, MPL. The really cool thing about that, that particular refueling plant is that it doesn't, it's not just a big tank of hydrogen, it actually generates hydrogen there. So it's a hydrolysis plant, so it actually extracts, it takes water, it splits it into hydrogen and oxygen. Incredibly energy inefficient, why would you do that? The thing is that they're actually using waste wind energy. So the, our grid can only cope with a certain amount of wind, and in the UK, we produce a lot of wind energy. So if you've ever seen a turbine that's not moving on a windy day, it's because it's been turned off, because the grid can't cope with the amount of electricity it's producing. So these guys are actually kind of keeping the wind turbine switched on and using that energy that would normally be wasted to produce hydrogen gas for future fuel cell vehicles. And the very last question. When you're at a pedestrian crossing, does the button do anything? Now, I did actually get an answer from, from the city of Liverpool for this. Um, in Oxford Circus in London, if you don't push the green the button, you won't get a green man. Uh, that's outside of kind of peak hours, otherwise it's on a timer. Um, in Manchester, about 40% of the buttons don't need to be pressed. They'll change anyway. In New York, there is about 2,500 lights that are placebo buttons. Uh, they're just there to make you feel better. Um, but in Lime Street, uh, that uses the same system as we have in London, which is called Scoot. And um, basically, if you don't push the button, you'll be waiting. You won't be waiting longer than two minutes, so that's the maximum waiting time in the UK. But so my advice is push the button. And that's it. Um, this is just a kind of a summary of the book, uh, each of the chapters. And uh, as I said, unfortunately, Liverpool's not in it as much as I would like, but there's lots of examples of current research, historic research, and I've spent a lot of time talking to scientists about what they're developing right now that's going to change the city tomorrow. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Does anybody have a question for 
Kamari. Yes, um, please. And as a citizen of Liverpool, yes. I accept that my city threatens people in St. Helens and Birmingham must feel threatened. Well, you guys are looking, you must know how hated you are. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, <laughs> thankfully, with my accent, I get away with it. So. <laughs> um, you talk about 54% in cities. Yeah. That's great for what about the other 46%. They are at a disadvantage because of cities. No, you're absolutely because right. Cities. It's a good point. No, it's, it's a good point. And it's, there's, a real, there's a real gap. So the, it's easier to put an infrastructure in place, a new infrastructure in place where there is one. So cities get the, bo the most of that kind of infrastructure and that investment, which is a real problem. Um, for me, it's not like a cities versus countries, country thing, because we need each other. Um, and some cities have a much better balance between how they invest in rural infrastructure and how they invest in urban infrastructure. But the UK is not good at it. Um, it's not to say that we're the worst at it, we're not, but we're really not good at giving the same benefits to those living in the city than, than not. And actually, and this isn't just meant to you specifically, but we are, we have, we've actually never lived for longer either, right? That's a huge benefit of humankind, right? We, uh, that's medicine that's done that. We, we are alive for longer because of modern medicine, but we are getting older. And cities, in theory, would be the perfect place for older people to live because you've got things that you can walk to. They're not. They're really not suitable for older people and that we have to change the way we design our cities so that they are better places for older people to live in. Um, that's also true for a rural environment, but that's never changed. So it, there's no simple answer. And I think you're, you're right. There's definitely a, there's a bias towards cities in terms of giving people the infrastructure they need. But it doesn't seem like that's going to change, unfortunately. It does seem like people see, keep flowing to the city. So all the money piles in there too, unfortunately. Sorry. <laughs> I don't agree with it either, but I'm wrong. Yeah. I was brought up in the countryside. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, so it depends on the grid. So basically, each country um, has, because if you think about what the national grid is, it's basically a series of turbines, right? So it's spinning things. Um, and it has a constant flow of electricity in theory. You can turn a power plant on or off and get electricity out. The problem with wind is that it's intermittent. So you don't get it continuously and you might get it and it might surprise you because it was windier than you expected. So most grid managers set a cap on how much of the grid is being produced by wind energy just because it makes the maths easier and it makes the logistics easier to make sure that you're getting supply and demand always balancing. So yeah, in a lot of places you just turn the turbines off or sometimes the turbines are let spin but the electricity's just literally being thrown away. Um, so ge genuinely, and it really, so I didn't know that until I spoke to national grid people. And that's, there's a limit, I think it's about 25% in the UK and Ireland. Um, so it can't cope with more than that. But on many occasions in the last few years, we've been producing considerably more than that. We know Scotland is producing massive amounts of, of wind energy, but their grid has been reconfigured to cope with more of it. So it is about redesigning the grid. But I think as I talk about in the book a lot, there's going to be a lot more mutual energy production. So a lot of cities are taking ownership of producing electricity and they're selling stuff back to the grid. So it's, go it's, it's going to be a lot more mutual than it is now where it seems to be central grid electricity out. It's going to be a lot more mutual. But yeah, wind, it, we're massively underusing it. Yeah. Yeah. How did you again? Oh yeah, so it's a thermal image basically. So it's really simple. It just looks for heat signatures because we are warm. Right, humans are warm. We're warmer than the concrete around us and the walls around us. So it's a thermal camera that basically looks for a heat signature and it counts the number of heat signatures. So it can kind of guess how many cyclists are there. And it depends again on the city, but they look for a minimum number. So if they say they've got like, oh, there's 10 cyclists there, it's actually better for us to give the cyclist more time to get off the line, let the cars wait behind. And yeah, it's, it's something that's happening in Copenhagen and Denmark, they do a lot of it as well. So it's mostly just a thermal image. Yeah. Do you think about um, flooding and runoff? You know, it's about like porous materials and that. Yeah, that's a huge problem. So, like, like all of the, the bitumen road surfaces that we use are incredibly, they just don't let water get through them. And water is a cycle. You know, the water that drops from the sky we need it to get down into our aquifers or down into our water supply. And as we're putting more and more tar all over our cities and more and more concrete, we're making it much harder for water to get back to where it needs to go for us to use it again. 
Um, so some cities are starting to develop permeable um, pavements. So materials that kind of look a bit like concrete, but are much more porous, so they allow water to pass through. Uh, not something we're doing in the UK, as far as I find. So I did ask around a lot. Um, and yeah, we need more green space in our cities for the same reason. Well, not just for that reason, but also that's a much easier way for us to get water back into the system. Green areas also cool down the city. We've got something called the urban heat effect, which is related to these materials. They absorb a lot of heat. We actually would like quite a lot of that heat to go into plants because the water will evaporate off the plants, cooling the air around us, cooling down our cities. So we need a combination of more green areas in terms of getting the water back to where it needs to go and also to reduce the temperatures in our cities. When they turn off a wind turbine, yeah. how do they do it? Is it heavily brain or stopped it? Or is it done electrically? Behind? It's done electrically, yeah. A, a reverse. Yeah, it's, yeah, that's exactly it's the big thing. Yeah, yeah, someone just goes, stop. No, yeah, it's done electrically normally. And when you talk about throwing electricity away, it's yeah. too much of it. Yeah. It just basically means they, they stop the connection because it's, it's, it's effectively a turbine. So the blade turns and it turns a, it turns a generator inside that big big bit at the back of the device. So they just switch off the connection between the two. So the blade's turning, but it's no longer connected to the generator. So uh, it, and, and it depends, because some turbines you can you can switch them off kind of from a distance. Yeah, but, yeah it's, it's, that's, that's exactly what they are. And actually there's some interesting stuff happening in turbines where they're moving all the back to hydraulics. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> Yeah, one more question. That we're at there. It's an amazing array of things you're talking about. So far, what's the most optimistic and pessimistic post <laughs> so far? Um, it's interesting because I I kind of went into the book thinking that I'd find like the city that's doing the best job. You know, I didn't at all. Um, I think if if we if we take nothing on board, if we don't make any changes, if we don't start to put more permeable membrane permeable surfaces around, if we if we don't move away from fossil fuels. I think we all know where we're heading. Um, but I think there's lots of lessons to be learned in individual cities. So some cities are really good at making their transport system more efficient. And some cities are really good at you know, optimizing their water usage. No one city is doing it all. Um, but I'm optimistic in terms of there seems to be there seems to be much more communication between those cities. Yeah, there's definitely there's a real sharing kind of economy happening now between cities where they go, I really like what you're doing there. I'm going to try and do that now. And like the, the, the plastic roads thing has been hilarious because I actually got someone from the highways agency contacted me because they saw a talk I gave. I was like, you guys, I shouldn't be doing this for you. This is not my job. Um, but yeah, I'm optimistic that those conversations are happening much more now. And in many cities, it's now cheaper to produce electricity using renewable sources than it is fossil fuels. And I'd love for us to be in completely environmentally positive, well, environment-wise, we have to do it this way. But there has to be a cost benefit too, realistically. And in the UK and Germany, it's now cheaper to produce electricity with wind energy than it is with coal and gas. In China, it's cheaper to produce electricity using solar power than it is with coal. So there is a shift happening. And it's not just an environmental shift, but a financial shift. And people are starting to see this isn't something we could think about investing in. It's stupid if we don't invest in it. Mm -hmm. So I'm optimi much more optimistic than I was before I wrote the book, if I'm honest. Yeah. Good. I'll be around. If anyone wants any yeah. more questions, I'll be around.